Hey guys, thanks for joining us for this 136th episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Special guests on this episode include Ken Seeley. We'll be talking about the new season of Intervention, which premieres Monday, October 18th. We'll also visit with John Cameron Mitchell as the podcast musical Anthem Homunculus, which is available now. We'll also visit with actor Peter Stormare. He's part of the new movie, The Grand Duke of Corsica, which is in theaters now. We'll also visit with entrepreneur and founder of Starlet Galleria, Olivia Starling. We'll discuss marketing with some TikTok ads. And we'll visit with luxury builder and the ultimate home creator, Scott Hamilton Harris, for our monthly visit. Of course, if you would, please take the time to subscribe, comment, leave some feedback, check out the shop, and of course, share with your friends. Now, at 95 years of age, Queen Elizabeth is being asked to give up one of her daily rituals, her evening cocktail. Now, the Queen has a drink every night, usually a martini, but her doctors have advised her to stop. A source says, quote, it's not really a big deal for her. She is not a big drinker, but it seems a trifle unfair that at this stage in her life, she's having to give up one of her very few pleasures got a new season of Intervention that is going to premiere on Monday, October the 18th, 10 Eastern, 9 local time on A&E. And from that, we've got uh, expert Ken Seeley with us. And first off, Ken, I appreciate you taking some time to be on the show. No, it's an honor to be here with you. Thank you for having me. Now, now, Ken, since being on Intervention since 2005, I mean, I know you've seen the ups and downs and, and, and things changing over the years, but how much different did uh, were things taken on the emotional side of things over these last two years? What are the biggest differences that you've seen? Um, I think the biggest differences that are happening right now are, you know, the families that I'm noticing are a lot sicker. They're, um, they're continuing to enable more and being more co codependent. And I, I feel so honored to be a part of the show because we're able to show that, how, how it's a real family disease and it's not the addict's disease, if that makes sense. That, that's right. Now, the uh, the upcoming season coming up on Monday, I know you guys have got uh, a big episode run in, in California. And Ken, I wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that uh, that you guys were seeing in the in the fentanyl crisis going on. Yeah, we're really, really excited about the, you know, the new season coming on starting on Monday. We're, we're, we're excited to show the general public, you know, how bad this fentanyl crisis is and how quickly the numbers of deaths are happening because there are things that you could be doing in order to, to, to see it and recognize it and hopefully intervene. You know, you don't need a big intervention process as you know, you see on TV, there are things that you could be doing to intervene before it gets to that point. And fentanyl, I mean, it is so bad right now, the deaths, you know, all you have to do is Google it. You could see how bad it is in our country and see that there's something that you could do. And that's what the intervention show is really about. Showing the public do something to put an end to this or a dent, not an end. I don't think we'll ever see an end. And for you, Ken, how rewarding is it personally to to see the help that people are able to to take from what you've gone through yourself and, and being able to apply that to their own lives. I mean, how, how personally rewarding is that for you? Well, it's such an honor and a privilege to be a part of the show because it really is educating millions and millions of people in the last, what, 16 years. And um, people are really seeing, you know, I get it from both ends. The families are seeing that they could do something. And, you know, I hear it all the time. The addict sits there and watches the show while they're using and saying, I'm not that bad. And then all of a sudden a light bulb turns on after watching many episodes and they say, oh, maybe I am and I need to get some help. And what do you think uh, is the biggest misconception folks have from the outside looking in? If somebody's got a, a, an issue, I mean, what do you think is the biggest misconceptions people that people have about addictions and, and addictive personalities as well? 
Well, I think the the, mis, the the people that are looking at it from the outside and they see it as an intervention being intrusive, you know, they had that old saying about the Johnson model that um, it's it's aggressive, assertive, it's it's intrusive, it doesn't work. Um, the intervention show, I don't believe, does the Johnson model. Um, it's more, I personally don't do the, inter, the Johnson model. I do more of a family systemic model. So it's intervention is not intrusive it's not it's not punitive it's really one of the most loving and respectful things that you could do for somebody that's out there suffering and i think that's the that's the shift that needs to happen intervention is not punitive it is respectful and loving and necessary if you want to save your loved one's life and Ken, also talk about the teamwork that it takes. I mean, it, it's not just one person, but there's there's so many different individuals that bring a different part to the team. And talk about the team that you guys work with and, and, and how extraordinary it is to see what the others add into the group as well. Uh, the team is amazing. I mean, the team is, you know, one of the, the, I mean, they're the miracle workers behind the scenes that really make this show so good. You know, it's like, I always tell the producers, you know, I'm really, really good at what I do because it's a passion and I love what I do. And, um, but for the team, I don't know how they take days and days of days of footage and be able to create something so powerful. So to have such an extraordinary team that goes in and produces it and edits it, it's just, it's such an honor to work with everyone because, you know, winning the Emmy for, you know, years ago and being um, nominated multiple times. I mean, they're, they're really out there showing the reality of what's happening and giving people hope. I think that's the best way to put it. They're giving people hope. That is right. And again, the new season premieres on Monday, October 18th at 10 Eastern, 9 local time on A&E. And Ken, also want to make sure and uh, let folks know if they would like to follow, find more information social media wise about yourself, sir. Yeah, yeah. No, watch, um, follow it on A&E. You know, um, you could go to, where do we have it? We have it on um, Facebook, the A&E uh, Web or intervention. And then if you go to Twitter, we do a lot of Twittering. I noticed on the last season premiere um, on Twitter um, at, at a &E TV and then um, hashtag intervention. All right. Well, Ken, it has been great to visit with you, sir. I appreciate the work that you guys are doing and looking forward to a new season of episodes starting Monday. Well, thank you for having me. And we're really excited to help and show people what we're doing. Well, half of America would be willing to travel to space, but a lot less would be willing to pay for it. In a new survey, 49% of people say they'd travel to space, but of those, just 19% would pay $100,000 or more to make it happen, and it will cost at least that much. Now, seats on Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 are estimated to start at a whopping $250,000 per person. Now, 60% of people think that space travel should be accessible for everyone, not just those who can afford the exorbitant cost. And even if the prices do come down eventually, 24% aren't sure that space tourism is ethical, because frequent space travel could be bad for the environment. We're going to talk about a, a new podcast series, Anthem Homunculus. We've got John Cameron Mitchell with us today. And J John, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show, brother. For sure. You know, it's, I, I'm, I'm a little bit in mourning lately because my, you know, my favorite uncle, you know, the friend of the family that you called the uncle, who just died in Oklahoma, actually. So I was just reminded, you know, it happened yesterday and, uh, or day before yesterday. And, um, I miss him a lot, and he's being um, buried tomorrow, I believe, Oklahoma City. I, we used to live in lot in uh, Fort Sill when we were kids. Oh, wow. That's uh, it, It's a small world, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. Now, tell us ab about the podcast idea, where that came from. I know this, uh, th this comes from the musical side, and, and tell us kind of where the inspiration to turn this into a podcasting platform idea. When did that come for you? Well, we, we wrote it first for the theater, Brian Weller and I, the composer, and uh, 
it was starting to swell. So then we're like, this could be really cool as a TV series. But it was, you know, it was w- too weird for everybody, just like our first, my first musical, Head Big and the Angry Inch. I tend to do things that are too weird for the moment and then are eventually on Broadway someday. <laughs> but the, uh, this one was too much. So we, we had a great offer to do it as a podcast series with this wonderful company called Topic. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. So, you know, I've always liked audio theater and it was just, it's just kind of in the last few years kind of coming up and starting to be adapted for television later, like Homecoming and, and Dirty John and this is various shows that are including the one that I just played Joe Exotic, you know, was based on the podcast rather than the TV show. So we thought, what a great form. And we had this great partner in Topic. And uh, so I started just asking people I knew if they wanted to, you know, to spend a few days. So we ended up getting this great cast because it wasn't time-consuming and they're just very collaborative people like Glenn Close, Patty Lupone, Cynthia Erivo, Dennis O'Hare, Laurie Anderson. Uh, my character plays, or I, I play a character who's down and out and he's got a brain tumor. So he's crowdfunding his health care uh, because he has no insurance. You know, he's in Kansas, Junction City, Kansas, and he all he can think to do is a live GoFundMe because no one's interested in his GoFundMe. So he's going to become... He's going to go viral as this interesting guy who's talking every day and trying to save his own life, you know, to get his tumor out. But it starts to become hallucinatory, and his tumor, he feels, might be alive, and you're not sure if he's imagining it or if he thinks it might be God. And it becomes very surreal, as things do when you have things wrong with your brain, right? Um and he sees the afterlife. So there's these amazing hallucinations with uh, people that he loved who are in the beyond. So you have Patti LuPone, you know, who famously played Evita, playing my aunt, who is actually a nun, um, and singing a song about the beginning of time and, and telling jokes, and she's a jazz singer. And so it's a very surreal but entertaining uh, odyssey uh, through someone's brain um, with a killer cast. What does that say to you whenever you get those yeses back from folks that wanted to also be a, a part of the cast as well? I mean, what does that mean for you on the personal side, John? It means a lot because it feels like I'm part of part of a community. You know, I I came up, you know, from Junction City, Kansas, and with you know didn't even have theater there and. You know, we, we moved on to Albuquerque, Army bases, you know, uh, and it, I discovered theater, you know. And through that, I discovered um, so many other wonderful things that, that, that led to Hedvig. Um, and then Hedvig being a, a cult musical that I, I like being on the outside rather than the mainstream because who wants to sit, who, who wants a life where they can't sit in a park without being a you know, harassed, but, but, you know, grabbed, taking a picture, selfie, selfie, selfie. You know, there's worse things. You could be also living under that bench. Um, but there was, I love the idea of the outsider because I always was one. And when other outsiders, which I think of as some other artists that I love, say, hey, I get what you're doing. I like what you're doing. I want to do something with you. That's the best compliment. It's when people say, I want to make something myself because you did something unusual. Um, and enough people saw it that it was, uh, you know, that you were allowed to do another one. After Hedwig, I was offered a lot of big movies to direct, but I was older and I, I was pickier and I didn't, I knew that just taking the money and, you know, the equivalent of a Marvel movie, I, it wouldn't have made me happy because I wouldn't have final cut, you know, and, when you're, you know, 28, you do it, of course, but I was already 30, 38, and I was like, I know what I like, you know. Of course, when you get older and you have a family or you have health health issues, then you start to take the Marvel movies, <laughs> you, can, you know, you can buy a house. But I've always lived with a very low overhead, 
you know, and that allows me to make my weird stuff that my, uh, the weirdos out there, uh, are touched by, and that makes me feel good. There you go. And again, uh, the, the podcast musical Anthem, Anthem, Humun- uh, oh man, I, I did it once. I know. Homunculus. There we go. That's it. And John, I want to make sure and let folks know where to find uh, the podcast and then everything you've got going social media wise as well, sir. Yes. Well, that is uh, anywhere you get your podcast, you will find and some homunculus. So um, I'll also tell you another Oklahoma based thing. You know, I just finished playing Joe Exotic in the Peacock TV series, which will be out next year. And, you know, my Oklahoma roots were showing <laughs> under under the bleached blonde. So just wait till you see the mullet. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's it's actually a much emotionally richer thing than the, do- the docu series. You get some deep deep stuff in this, and I think it, you know I'm, I'm very excited about it. It's the best role I played since since Head Big eventually, and it has a lot in common. And again, the the, the podcast anthem. Homunculus. John Cameron Mitchell, it's been great to visit with you today, sir. Thank you for your time, and uh, hopefully we'll catch up uh, as, the, as the Joe Exotic thing gets closer. All right. Uh, R.I.P. Jerry Orr from Oklahoma, a great man. Thanks. Now, the Cheesecake Factory has nearly three dozen cheesecakes on their menu which seems excessive, but being excessive was one of the founding pillars of the Cheesecake Factory in the first place, right? Well, a guy named Vince Mancini went to one of the locations recently and ordered a slice of all 35 cheesecakes. Now, he didn't finish every slice, but he did taste test each one to make a comprehensive rating of the cheesecakes. And it was subjective. Vince said none were bad, but some weren't his taste. For example, he's not a huge chocolate person. Now, in the end, he gave the top honors to the Dolce de Leche Caramel Cheesecake. The runner-up was the Lemon Meringue, followed by the Key Lime, the Tiramisu, and the French Strawberry. Now, the rest of the top ten were the White Chocolate Raspberry Truffle, the Ultimate Red Velvet, the Celebration, the Pumpkin, and the Lowlicious Cheesecake and Fresh Strawberries. The original came in 11th. Now his least favorite was the Godiva Chocolate Cheesecake, and Uproxx.com has a full breakdown of each one, and there's even an amusing photo of Vince, which he says was taken around hmm, cheesecake number 25 or number 26. You can find him on Twitter, at Vince Mancini. I don't know how many movies I've watched him in, but uh, I'm excited to talk about the new one, The Grand Duke of Corsica, which is opening in theaters. And first off, Peter Stormare, it is a privilege to have the chance to visit with you. Thank you. Privilege to be on your show. Yeah. <laughs> the Grand Duke of Corsica. I wish you had a better name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, Peter, tell tell our listeners a little bit about uh, about the new film and kind of the timeliness of the story, too. Well, oddly enough, you know, like European movies, this is kind of a what they call an art movie that goes to festivals and gets some prizes here and there. And we've been successful. And usually for European art movies, it takes a year or two before they hit the U.S. market if there's an interest. And we've been lucky enough to have some interest for this movie. And uh, it was actually shot in uh, 2019 in October, November, wrapped early December. And uh, well, then, you know, like one month later, the pandemic hit us. And and we thought this was kind of strange. And, uh, but then we said, but hey, man, I mean, we're trying to show some light in the midst of a pandemic and maybe that's what we're supposed to do. And uh, as I said, you know, to some of my friends before, we are here, you and I are talking for the first time, Cameron, you and I are talking here, but we are able to talk to each other because our ancestors fought very hard to walk through atrocities, famines, wars, pandemics, 
So you and I had the privilege to be on this earth. And maybe our duty to future generations is to try to carry the light through these dark days and years, you know, not to be impatient and say, get over. It's got to go back to normal right away. This is a big lesson to be learned from us impatient people and trying <laughs> to show trying to show that we also are worthy as our ancestors to pave the way for new generations to come and maybe to make life a little bit better to mm. see the light to see to to see the good things and i think in the movie what i try to contribute is the beautiful world of fantasy and art and uh, dedication to to the future i mean i'm building a mausoleum for myself because i'm about to die in the movie and i hire a guy who's very fundamental into being an architect you know how big is the coffin how big is the mausoleum how high is it how wide is it and i say i, I don't care you know it's just fan <laughs> it's like i'm i'm in a fantasy world i'm like he's like being dragged down by a white rabbit into a, a rabbit hole <laughs> and to and together we feed off each other and we I would say we fall in love mentally, you know, or soul, soul, soul like we fall in love, not physically, but with our souls, we, we see new things and new things in life that are worth fighting for. And I think for me, myself, during these hard times of a pandemic, I found things that are worth fighting for and are worth lifting the light, the torch of light and say the future has good things waiting for us just as long we can be patient and have solidarity and fight for yeah fight for our soulmates and our friends and for the future because i wouldn't be here today if my ancestors didn't have that mentality there's so many that aren't here because you know things went wrong but we are here for a reason. And I think that reason is just to show some light and positive thinking for the future. Great things are going to come. Great things are going to come. And and for your role in this, you talked about uh, Alfred being straight and uh, down the straight and narrow. Your character, not so much. And uh, it, through that, I think one of the great takeaways from that is no matter how different we are, there we can still share love and, and be good to one another. I think that's something that we don't see enough of. No. I agree. And, and, you know, to be just to accept people being different. And I, I grew up in a small village in northern Sweden. And, and I mean, we had also what we call village fools. <laughs> but I was always intrigued because they had something that I didn't have. They knew about things or or this guy had something in his hand and I finally got to see and he opened his hand. There was nothing. I said, there's nothing. And he told me, and I will always remember, I was maybe 12 years old. And he said, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist there. Mm. For him, it existed. It was something that he treasured. And for me, it's like I'm walking around still. I have something in my hand that I can see and I can feel and I can touch. But maybe other people can't see it, but I try to, at least when I act and in my daily life, I try to send that out. Even when I do bad, bad, <laughs> bad characters, you know, like, like really bad killers and whatever, kidnappers. But I always try to send out there's something good within this character that is worth, I want even if you dislike the things I'm doing, I wish the audience would feel like they would like to have a cup of coffee with me and ask me why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because a lot of people in, in movies and on TV that are bad crooks or you know killers, rapists or whatever, you tend to shun away from them and they become very one dimensional. And I think we're all have, we're three dimensional human beings. 
we have both darkness and light in us. It's just a way of how we try to maneuver the light and darkness. Well, and, that's... Um, yeah, it's getting a little deep here, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, Peter, but again... It, the... Yeah, but because it's, it's, it's in the midst of a, of a pandemic, we need people to shine some light, you know, that, that things will get better. We, this is a learning. This is something we have to learn from. It's, it's a big, big mother nature is trying to teach us something. And if we're stubborn enough and we don't want to learn, then we're doomed. But take this, you know, we don't have to go on vacation for, you know, this year because it, there's a pandemic. We don't have to go on the cruise ship and risk our lives. So, but they knew that in the good old days. Today, we, we, we're so impatient. Now. It's <laughs> we, <gotta> be. <laughs> we're just a little impatient, Peter, just a little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's awesome. Again, the new movie, The Grand Duke of Corsica, is available. Be sure and check that out. And, and Peter, always want to make sure and let folks know where they can find more info uh, social media-wise on you as well. Oh, man, I'm, I'm bad at Twitter and social media, but I have Instagram. I, I update my Instagram because I find Twitter and Facebook so negative, And I always, you know, people are so angry. Actually, on Instagram, people are very nice. Yeah, they are. So, and there, there's a lot of imposters. But if you go on the real storm air, the real storm air, I'm there on Instagram. But there's like 24 imposters, so beware of them. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Look for the blue check mark. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. The blue check mark. Well, Peter, it took me. A, yeah, it took me a while to get it because they, they mm -hmm. said on Instagram, I'm not the one. The real Peter Stormer is someone else that gave a check mark to you. So finally, after one year, I got it back. <laughs> That's good stuff. Well, Peter, it has been a privilege to visit with you, sir. I look forward to checking out the movie myself, and uh, hopefully we'll catch up yeah. again real soon, sir. Don't fall asleep until I get on the screen, okay? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this seems like good news for anyone who's chronically underslept. Having dark circles under your eyes might be trendy now. Earlier this year, a TikToker with 3 million followers named Kara Karstens did a makeup tutorial where she added extra shading under her eyes. Now, it went viral, so other people started doing it. And now a bunch of news outlets like Yahoo Style are saying that dark bags are suddenly in vogue. Now, is it actually true, though? It kind of seems like the real trend is for young, fresh-faced people to make themselves look exhausted, so your authentic under-eye bags might not get the same reaction. But some folks online are pushing to normalize the look and get people to stop covering them up with concealer. She is the founder and CEO of the jewelry brand Starlet Galleria. We've got Olivia Starling with us today, and we're going to talk about TikTok ads. I was uh, intrigued by this because I've wondered, uh, because I've used Facebook ads. She says TikTok ads can serve you better. First off, Olivia, good to visit with you and, uh, and looking forward to learning today. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me on, Cameron. Now, where did you originally get involved with doing TikTok ads in the first place? And, and why tried those over Facebook? Or was it just feeling out uh, the, the different social media sites? Yeah, well, I learned Facebook ads, but I learned them late in the game. And I remember everybody in Facebook ads saying, oh, the glory days when it was so cheap and when no one was on there. And so when TikTok came out with their ads platform sometime around last year, I thought, I want to know the glory days of TikTok since I never <laughs> had the chance to do Facebook. So I hopped on that bandwagon pretty quickly. And um, I discovered it was actually way more simple than Facebook. What is the hardest part or, or the learning curve making ads for TikTok? Like you said, you've done Facebook. We've all done Facebook ads. What's, <laughs> what's, the, what's the biggest hurdle getting ready for the TikTok ads? 
I think for most people, it's a mental hurdle where they go, I don't know how to make a TikTok video. I don't dance. I can't do that. I'm not young. And so, you know, I, I felt the same thing. So I just went on and, you know, market research, staying up till two in the morning, swiping TikTok. I don't know if you've ever ended up in that. <laughs> oh, we all have been there. <laughs> that life cycle, but I would just stay up late and find people on TikTok that I really liked the content they were making. And then I would go to their Instagram profile, shoot them a message and say, hey, can I send you free product? And in exchange, if you like it, make me a TikTok video. So um, I think the first hang up people are on is I don't know how to make a TikTok video, but you don't have to know. You can just find someone else that does. What are the big five things? I know you said that there are five keys that you learned about TikTok ads, making them better than Facebook. What What is the formulation that uh, that shows? Is it the input and output uh, psychology on that one? Yeah. So the first thing is with Facebook, I know I spend a ton of money on Facebook ads and I still use them because they're definitely effective. Um, but on TikTok, you know, the reason why Facebook is such a big um, like expense is because it's everybody's bidding against each other. And so we're going against airlines and people with huge budgets. Mm -hmm. But on TikTok right now, there's so few advertisers that the bid is really, really cheap because you're not competing with a ton of people and a lot of really big brands still aren't on there. So I think the first thing is that TikTok is so much cheaper than Facebook. You can start out at $20 a day and still have a really effective ad. Whenever you're putting together an ad for, for TikTok, what are, the, what are the kind of things that you specifically want to highlight? Because obviously the, the, the viewership is different than what you're targeting on Facebook and other socials. Yeah, I like to keep it native. Like you don't want it to look super professional because I don't know about you, but when I am on TikTok, um, if I see something that looks like an ad, I usually just swipe up right away. <laughs> um, but there's times when it's awesome because I'll be watching something and I won't realize it's an ad until the very end when they hit me with the call to action. And so just keeping it looking native to TikTok, keeping it engaging and fun. And honestly, it doesn't have to be clean cut or professional. One of my best ads is actually me in my basement just showing an engagement ring. It was just super simple and easy. And I can't believe that that one like outperformed other really nice polished and clean ones that we tried. The going into a new genre of advertising. I mean, what what is your thought process whenever you first come in? Like we, we already talked, we've all done the Facebook and all that. How did you have to get yourself mentally prepared? Yeah, getting mentally prepared for TikTok, I thought that it was going to be so different. Um, I was worried that, you know, learning another platform, all of that was just going to be like such a huge learning curve. But if you actually get into the back end of TikTok ads, it looks identical to Facebook ads. And so creating like your ad, your ad set, your campaign, all of that, like it's just exactly the same. And so I think that you know, understanding that TikTok actually just wants to take Facebook advertisers from them anyway, <laughs> like knowing that they're <laughs> trying to make it simple for you as it can be was kind of what like ended up selling it to me was that I realized they already knew how to do all that stuff. And what do you accredit the success of those ads? I mean, I know you talked about keeping it native, keeping it looking non uh, produced so much, if you will. What do you attribute that success to? Well, the greatest thing is TikTok's algorithm. And if you're not familiar with the For You page, pretty much every video that you watch to completion, heart or whatever, TikTok starts like throwing more of that to you. So if you're watching like cute puppies, uh, then all of a sudden all you're getting are cute puppies. And that <laughs> algorithm also helps you out when you're an advertiser because TikTok wants to keep people on the platform. And so, you know, if somebody like for jewelry, we're kind of in like a women's accessory bland. And so we'll end up getting more things that are like, not just women's accessories, but it's also women who are watching makeup tutorials end up getting advertised to us. And so that really smart algorithm actually helps out our ads, like as ad advertisers, we're getting like the algorithm to work for us, not against us. And how hard is it to you to, to wrap your head around algorithms and uh, hashtags and all of that stuff? How hard is that? Is, is that a big difference for you on this uh, platform as well? Uh, 
you know, it's interesting. I, since I'm running ads, you're paying for the, the views. And so I don't ever hashtag, I don't worry about it. Um, I try to not get too caught up in just like the details of the algorithm, but just the overall understanding of what kind of content would the end user that's going to purchase from us, like what is our avatar looking for? And so as long as I keep just a high level understanding of it, I feel like my ads will be successful. I think we can all get caught up in like, where do I put things? How often do I do it? I just try to only make sure that like the ads are running and as they start running, they gain momentum. And then that means the algorithm has started working in your favor and life is good. Now, what is one of the best success stories you've seen from a TikTok ad that you've put out? Well, yeah, first, when I first tried to experiment with TikTok ads, uh, nobody, I was in a bunch of business groups for Facebook advertising. No one was doing TikTok ads. And I was like, I'm just going to give it a try. I really want to see what happens. And um, the, the thing that I started to realize, I turned on my TikTok ad. I just ran a basic traffic campaign. I did it with like random little videos that I had created at first. And I I did this and all of a sudden my Facebook ads were working so much better. And everyone in my business group, we were trying to figure it out. But what we were seeing was that people would go on TikTok, they would maybe see my ad, they might click over to my website, they go to my website and the pixel tracks them. And then they go on Facebook and they get retargeted. And so all of a sudden it was like this light bulb went off. I thought, okay, so if people aren't purchasing directly from TikTok, at least I'm getting the increased traffic. And then my uh, demographic would be women in like their Mm thirties. So typically they would also have a Facebook page and then they would go to Facebook and they would see it again. And there was their social proof. And all of a sudden everything was like this well-oiled machine where the TikTok made my Facebook work so much better. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of times you don't think of uh, working hand in hand with a, a, a competitor. But uh, but, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty interesting uh, insight on that one as well. Now, Olivia, we've talked about uh, Starlet Galleria. If, if folks want to find more info about that, obviously, your uh, your TikTok, your Facebook uh, in, website, all that. Where's the best place to keep up with uh, with everything you've got going as well? Yeah, so anytime on Instagram, if you visit our website, starletgalleria.com, I also have come out with five tips for e-commerce business owners. If you want to know the top five things I would avoid as a new e-commerce seller, go to oliviaisnotaninfluencer.com backslash top five tips. Um, or follow me on Instagram. Olivia is not an influencer and I'll only influence you in the best way. And that's how to do better business. (laughs) There you go. I like that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Olivia, it has been great to visit with you. I'm going to take a few of those tips and I may actually make my first TikTok ad to go along with it too. How about that? I love it. I love it. I can't wait to hear about it. I'm not afraid to say it, but this kid is going places and he's probably lucky that jail isn't one of them after this. A high school senior in Illinois has recently pulled off the greatest rickroll prank of all time. As a senior prank, he managed to rickroll his entire school district all at once. Now, District 214 is right outside of Chicago, has over 11,000 students. And back in April, he hacked into their network and played the video on every television screen and projector at six different schools. Now, a few kids posted about it on social media when it happened, but we're just finding out the true scale of it now because he wrote a blog post about how he pulled it off. Now, we won't get into technical stuff, but he'd be planning this gun for several years, and he'd recruited a handful of other students to help, and they called it Operation Big Rick. Now, they didn't want to interrupt classes or do it when kids might be taking a test, so they made sure to avoid specific dates and times. At 10.55 a.m. on April 30th, all of the TVs and projectors in every class turned on. Now, the district has a blue box that's called a Navidia player connected to every TV that lets you turn it on and off remotely and control what plays. So that's how he did it. Now, at first, there was a message on the screen that said an important announcement was coming. 
and there was a timer counting down from five minutes. When it got to zero, everyone was waiting to see what the announcement was, then immediately realized it was a prank when Rick Astley came on. Well, 10 minutes after that, the entire system reverted to how it was working before, but they didn't stop there. At 2.05 p.m., all of the school bells went off at the end of a class, just like they should. But instead of a bell sound, they played the song again, so everyone got rickrolled a second time. And after that, men immediately sent a 26-page report to the school district outlining exactly how he and his hacker friends did it. And because of that, the district decided not to press charges. The director of technology actually thanked them for finding a flaw in their system. Well, Min graduated a few months later and he's now at the University of Illinois studying cybersecurity. It is time for our monthly visit with Luxury Builder, the ultimate home creator. I lovingly refer to him as John Lovitz with a hammer. We've got uh, Scott Hamilton Harris with us. And Scott, good to see you. And uh, uh, you're you're working through some stuff. I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, I've been talking to my psychologist for a while. And uh, she's no, it's <laughs> got COVID <laughs> we were talking about before. But yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm coming up on the other side of it finally. So. You know, it's interesting. You you spend so much time protecting yourself, right? You know, and your kids and family from getting COVID. And then you find out that, like, despite your best efforts and, it's, you know, the gloves, the sanitizers, the everything, the, the original thing of wiping the pizza box off because somebody may have right. touched it, you know, and then it turns out something out of your control, you get COVID. And so... Here I am. I guess I'm a statistic, but uh, <laughs> you're more than just a statistic, Scott. <laughs> oh, if you can't beat them, join them. So here I am with COVID. <laughs> so, so how is has that made some hampers on your work, or you you got a pretty good staff that? Well, they said you don't do a whole lot of work anyway. I don't know what they meant by that. Is that what my staff said? <laughs> <laughs> It's a good thing because the reviews are coming up. <laughs> good to hear that. <laughs> I'm not dropping any names, though. I'm not giving up names. <laughs> oh, I know who it is. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's been good. You know, it's it's great to have a good team. I've been doing this for so many years now. And, you know, I've um, with all loving respect, I think I've tortured my team so often that, you know, in the beginning, when they started working for me, new people, they they can't even write an email without every word being, you know, is it regard or is it regards to what's the, no, it's not regards. We don't plural. Yes. It is a big deal when you're dealing with people because, you know, and it really, here's the thing when you're dealing with people, they look at us, as you know, on every level, you're always being examined really, you know? And I think sometimes we think that we're just doing our one task and we don't have to do everything well, but if you don't, you know, that 10% of that you showed them, they'll multiply it times 90 and say, that's the person. That's what they're doing. Um, so it's, I, I don't know if I told you before, but we had, I think one of our biggest projects, we were hired and the ultimate reason was because my team was in such good shape. Wow. They said, and they said, they said they look great and they're really in great shape and they're happy. Uh, okay. That's all it took. <laughs> Not a bunch of models. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And she said, no, it's not that. It's that they're happy because they're working for someone that takes care of them. They're in shape and they're skinny and thin because they respect themselves. So then they'll respect me. They, they're active and they're doing a lot of work constantly. And they're not the kind of, you know, person that's going to be sitting in a chair all day. No offense, Cameron. You're, that's your job. <laughs> I, I do it well is what you're saying. I got you. <laughs> No, but I just like, you know, I mean, if your business is to be active and you don't look active, you know, that can be a, a, a sign, right? You know, it's like the skinny chef. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't trust the skinny chef. Yeah. Yeah. So um, anyway, so it's going well. It's been going well. That's cool. Now, uh, each month we uh, we get some questions in that uh, that we kind of delve into. And then from those, we kind of rabbit trail off a little bit. So uh, I, I figure we just go ahead and get into some questions first and then uh, wrap up after that. Is that cool? I love it. Let's do it. All right. Well, uh, first off, I, none of us. Well, 
I haven't been there lately, but we've got Stephanie in Las Vegas that said uh, that she wants to add solar panels to their house, but they aren't very attractive. Do you have any suggestions to how to possibly hide them? Oh, that's a good one. And I think I know who Stephanie is. I have been to Vegas on the show and there's a lot of Stephanie things that come out. (laughs) (laughs) It's interesting. And you do these things. Sometimes you meet people and they just, they're always there for you. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? Uh, Let's see, Stephanie, uh, your, how to make your solar panels more attractive. Um, You know, you know, besides or hiding them, besides putting them on your neighbor's house, which doesn't really do you much. <laughs> you know, it's interesting in that you can't really hide solar panels. And I think there's a whole concern about that. They do have the Tesla roof tiles that they're using, but uh, haven't had the best feedback on it so far. I think it's probably a product that's, you know, coming. But here's what you got to do. You got to be proud of it, Stephanie. You got to have some, some uh, solar pride. Come out of the closet. I mean, it's the way of... You know, it's those things. It's like everybody's afraid to show it, but show it off and be proud of it. Um, You know, but there's I will say, all right. With that said, when I did do Ed Begley's house, in all fairness, Cameron, I completely hit them. Oh, say it ain't so. Yeah, it was strategic, (laughs) you know. And so his house, it looks like a, um, you know, a 1920s home, uh, Mediterranean out of Hancock Park. You probably don't know where that is, but, you know, in the heart of Los Angeles, the historical districts. And that's what the house looks like. Clay tile roof, all recycled, of course. But then the the panels were strategically placed on a flat roof. And what we did is there's a little mansard, which is essentially just a little roof that extends up. And if you were to imagine it kept going, it didn't really. And then below that, we have a flat roof and we had... uh, enough power to light up the neighborhood. Not everybody can do that, but if you can, but I will give you a good tip too to hide something. Have you ever seen those really ugly um, panels that that heat up your pool for the domestic water? Mm -hmm. So came up with a really good idea. So Stephanie, show off your panels. (laughs) But as far (laughs) as what we did for Ed Begley's house, we had nowhere to put it. It was an afterthought. Scott, where am I going to put it? So I said, we realized we could take those like little radiator type tubes that heat up your solar. Um, I'm a little slow today. I got COVID. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) I got brain fog. We put them underneath Cameron, the the main solar panels. And when you consider the solar panels are black, they're heating up. So it actually acted as a radiator. And then below the main solar panels, we had a second layer. So we lived and we kind of put them up two stories on there. Um, it was, I thought it was ingenious. I don't know if everybody else does, but it was interesting that you actually got the radiation, radiated heat from the main solar panel, collecting it uh, from the sun. And then also you've got the radium heat from it as well, heating up the water. So it's kind of like water world. Right there. Cool. <laughs> Probably turned out had had a better response than uh, in reaction than water world though, right? Uh, I don't think anybody really cared except that <laughs> night, you know, we just went up there on the, the roof, you have a beer. You have a vegan sandwich, you know, you sweep off the panels, you kind of glaze them a little bit and and just, yeah, looks good. And then you go down to the (laughs) chute. That's good. Now, our next one, this one comes from Camarillo, California, uh, from Claude, from Claude. Uh, Said about a year ago, uh, they had their floors tiled and now notice that the grout is disintegrating. They called the person who did the work and he's balking at fixing the gaps where it's disappeared from or showing signs of where, what can we do? Ah, Claude. Yeah. You're, you're screwed, Claude. Um, <laughs> you know, you've got to stop using that water soluble uh, grout and you got to stop using those bad builders. Um, no, but here's, here's something that most people don't know. Uh, have you ever done tile? Have they even done tile? I've, work helped, my bro- I've yeah. helped my brother-in-law. <laughs> yes. Right. And you've done the grout and it seems like, how could this ever go wrong? Right. Well, here's how it can go wrong. On the back of that package, there's an expiration date. And if you're six, that package is about six months or older from time of uh, assembly, the grout chemical agents that make it adhere when you make it wet, stop working. And you could be basically putting a bunch of beach sand in your tiles. 
I had no idea. Now, the other thing to look at, though, is sometimes the growl will come out because the substrate wasn't secured fast enough. You're going to have to excuse my jumbled language during COVID, but at least <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> you are. You, you've still made an appearance. You're, you're doing your best. Yeah, I'm doing my best. But, um, you know, one of the things that is important, though, is and I've seen this and I've gotten some of the biggest projects off of droughts, which is interesting. I think I've gotten one of our biggest clients, a billionaire. Is he, I went over to his house and he showed me the grout on his um, driveway and he had beautiful bluestone. He said, Scott, I know this is too small for you, but can you, can you help me on this? And he had like a little halo ring around the uh, tile. And he's like, I've tried everything. What we ended up figuring out, and this is also important we're doing grout, is they didn't seal the sides of the tile. So that's also part of it, because if you're putting your grout in and you've got a tile that's not fully sealed on all sides, that grout will go in there and the water will be sucked into that dry tile, right? And it'll pull everything out. So if you're not making that chemical bond in your grout when you're mixing it, and I know I'm getting nerdy and boring here, Claude, but you can just, you're going to take this little segment and show it to your contractor and say, eat this. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if it, that is what happens and the grout will completely come out. That's that's why we call him John Lovitz with a hammer is for reactions like that. <laughs> <laughs> so you did growl before, huh? Uh, well, just just helping somebody else out, uh, being uh, carrying stuff more than anything. Yeah, I, I didn't do I didn't put any in. No, no, it was one of the first things I started doing when I was younger was uh, doing tile work for people. I would do tile work till like two o'clock in the morning. And man, I was a perfectionist. You just sit there and tap, 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 tap. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm shimming it. <laughs> and wow, you know, the thing I did not know, you're just, you know, you learn things as a kid, right? That's uh, material is caustic and the grout is caustic and the adhesives are caustic. You're sitting there like at 2.30 in the morning, looking at your hand and seeing like, is that a hole? <laughs> oh, <I'm laughs> <that wrong. laughs> you know, there is nothing worse than like that slow cement burn, you know, when you've been working in the lot. Because <laughs> you don't feel it then. It doesn't hit then. It's like you got to wait until you're done and relaxed and tired before you really start to get the pain of that. So those are my early days of doing tile, but I hope that helps you, Claude. <laughs> there you go. And our final question comes from St. <laughs> Paul, Minnesota, from Nathan. Uh, he says he's got us. He's he's got an issue. He's got a stinky urine type smell in his bathroom. Said they've cleaned top to bottom and can't find what's the cause. And said there are no pets. So question mark. I think it's. I think Nathan. It's your brother Paul. <laughs> he's got terrible <laughs> aim. <laughs> <laughs> I just. I mean, yeah. I I don't know. I. Is there another name for urine? I mean, that is just not an attractive. <laughs> <laughs> Refuse. I, I don't know. Yeah, right. Yes. Uh, number one. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> You know, it's a common problem we get. And uh, there are several times where there is people that actually actively uh, are actually discharging something. It's not urine, though, more than likely. I don't know. I'm not going to come over to your house and Nathan and smell it. But um, I will tell you that more than likely when we smell urine or something of that and not to be gross, but it's uh, we assume that anything that's a sewer type gas smell is that and it's not and a lot of the homes are leaking some sign of sewer gas in them um and it's common and it's actually not good for you turns out and um I, I was funny i was talking to a client yesterday a new an old client who got a house and has a newborn and and tell them i said does the house have a smell to it we're talking about mold well, a little bit i just thought it was supposed to smell that way it's an old house it's like <laughs> And it's like saying my fish is supposed to smell fishy. Your house should not have any kind of smell. If there's any kind of odor coming from your house, even from a new house, is off gassing. It's not okay. Um, so what it could be, Nathan, is what we've seen before is a couple of different things. One is that there's a wax ring. I don't know if you've ever seen these, Cameron, nope. or put the toilet on. Yep. Well, there's a wax ring, and sometimes the bolts don't fit right, or you didn't get the extendo ring. You know, the one that's just a little higher. So when you scoot it, it actually makes contact. And what you're getting is sewer gas actually coming out of the house. And it's very slow and you can do everything. It'll drive you nuts. You're just, and you can't find it. Just like, it's like a big ball. Just nope over here. 
nope, I'm over here. Nope, I'm over here. <laughs> and it just drives people nuts. Um, something else to know about is it, it's probably not this, but oftentimes when we have a sink drain and, you know, if you've ever done your plumbing, when you've got the P-trap, you know what that's for, Cameron? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. You've had that smell before, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So that P-trap isn't to just be a P under there. It's uh, to pull the sewer gas out. Mm -hmm. So what happens after about a week or two, or depending on how hot it is, if you aren't using your sink, if you're not using your uh, dishwasher, if you're not using your bathtub or that shower, waiting for the special day to take a bath, that thing will dry out and you will get that same kind of smell. So, you know, what I would do is first um, run all the fixtures, let the water flush down there for about three to five minutes. That usually do it. It's kind of like the IT world, right? It's not working, sir. Please reboot your system. <laughs> so, when you're having a bad sewer smell, best thing, burn on the water. But yeah, I would also, if that doesn't work, I would check the toilet ring. That when when that was mentioned, that was the that was where my mind went was to the 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 ring around the toilet that the uh, but, that, that little it wax, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But it, hey. If that's not the thing, you're getting on the phone with your brother, Paul, because I have had. <laughs> You've had problems with Paul, too, haven't you? No, I've actually had a problem with, a, a, believe it or not, I had a problem with a plumber that did this in my house. He actually did that to my house. It was a poor guy. We were having great friend, you know, somehow I think too many drinks. And, you know, I think there was some animosity, Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, uh, Scott's going to pay for that. Oh, I know. He's in my bathroom and it's like you've got it's one of those you can't believe this is really happening moments. <laughs> oh, dude. Oh, you are kidding. Are you really been secretly angry at me? All these years? <laughs> you know, and there's his wife just like, you know, bawling and like, oh, this is not going to look good for you. But uh, yeah, we're still friends, good friends. But yeah, those those things happen. And and we had one client that actually um, they claimed that that somebody had peed in their one of their floor ducts, which it was really hard to try to just to find, figure that one out. That went on for four months. These smells are just bizarre because like trying to find them. And he's four. He's like somebody did. But you're trying to show them that there's a grate, right? That's really small. Right. And like you would take some laser accuracy unless the guy's laying on the face down on the floor. So they're like, I don't think I'm really able to, you know, but uh, I think that was his brother, Paul. But we eventually figured out what it was. They had uh, rodents in there and they were going inside. So that's just fun. Dude, still, How are you doing? How's your still, project in your place? Oh, well, actually, we moved on to uh, to, to some different projects. We're uh, we're actually in the uh, in the home looking stage now ourselves. Well, let's look for homes together. What are you looking for? I have no idea. You got to ask my wife about that. You know better than that. Well, you, well, you guys should. If you need some tips, you can always call and write in. You know, we I can know. Do it on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, Scott, what do you, what kind of projects once uh, once you get unquarantined? What's uh, what, what's up next for you? Uh, we've got a big uh, tenant improvement project. We've got a. Um, I mean, I would say there's nothing. Well, actually, there is a lot of ones. God, there's like there's some massive ones. I have a twenty thousand square foot one that's coming up that we're starting up on a, a big beautiful cliff and overlooking. It feels like the world. By the way, Cameron, I don't know. You've, you've been to L.A., right? Yes, I have. It's been and a minute. I, I get it. And if, I don't know if you're like me. I get excited when I drive on the 405 freeway and I can see like two planes. You're like, wow, look at the planes. <laughs> well, at this place, it's actually higher than where the uh, I guess it's at an elevation that would be beyond where the planes are at a cruising altitude. And I never knew this. But when you're up at his house, I mean, it's an aerial display of planes. You can see like 40 planes in the air from LAX. Wow. And then they're in highways and they're all equally spaced and they're all stacked, you know, four high. I've never seen anything like this, like a car showroom out there or something. And then the lights, the city, it's amazing. So it's a Mediterranean house. It's got a, uh, you know, the infinity pool. It's got the movie theater. It's got the gyms. It's got his suite, her suite, and maybe someone else's suite. Um, you know, it's, it is really great. I've got another one that we're doing that's a 20,000 square foot castle 
uh, mm-hmm. just like I drool when I see this thing. I'm the, the worst thing about having COVID is that I can't go out there and see it. And we've got another one that's coming out of the ground right now. That's uh, just in the basement, and it's the home is going to be uh, eco home, all mm-hmm. green. Uh, all the materials are steel. And the structural steel is going up now, three stories high. I mean, there is more steel in this thing, Cameron. Like I'm talking about those big structural columns, you know, the ones that mm-hmm. look like mm-hmm. uh, when you're putting up a high rise. I mean, this is like a low rise, high rise. I've never seen anything like this. I mean, we've got the shop drawings, Cameron, usually are a couple pages on the, on the steel. I have 178 pages just for the shot drawings. And each page is one piece of steel. Wow. Goes into this house. So it's like a puzzle. And then we've got another. We probably don't have much time, but I've, I'm pretty busy with all these things. We've got a lot more that are coming and a lot more that are going up and things that we're finishing. So um, it's exciting. And it's exciting to be, you know, it's a very complicated, complex business. And, you know, I think we're talking here. Look, we're simplifying and we're just having fun and talking about the simple parts of it. Um, I think it's it makes it a little more understandable, but it's very complex. You know, it, they're and unfortunately, they don't have a way for most people to learn how to do this professionally. So it takes a lifetime to figure this thing out. So um, I appreciate it. I think this is a good forum because, you know, we get opportunity for people to ask, you know, smaller questions and get mm-hmm. engaged. But the real work out there is to be done. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Again, yeah. uh, Scott, I always want to make sure and uh, and let our listeners know if they want to keep up with uh, with, with your uh, activities, uh, social media, website, all that. What's uh, where's the best place to keep up? Uh, it's 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 uh, let's see. You know what? My publicist made a few more sites, but I can't remember them all. She's going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> but Building C Group is the name of the company. Building Construction Group. Uh, if you want to find me on Instagram, it's Scott uh, underscore Harris underscore building. I think there's also Scott Hamilton Harris builder or Scott Ham. I don't know. There's too many of them. Uh, <laughs> but if you want to reach me, you know, the best way is always in an email. It's Scott at uh, buildingcgroup.com. And or reach out to you, Cameron. That's right. They can always right? hit us up. Uh, GQ oh. with Cam at gmail.com. Just that simple. I watch your stuff all the time, man. I'm I'm your biggest fan. (laughs) I need somebody, right? Yeah. (laughs) Well, Scott, it is always great to visit with you, sir. I I look forward to you feeling a little better. Glad uh, you're you're better than you were. And uh, we will look forward to catching up again next month, my friend. All right. Thank you. And let's talk about your place next time. Well, thanks again for joining us for this 136th episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. If you ever have a comment, question, or anything else you'd like to know, just hit me up on the contact page at gqwithcam.com. You can also find me on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook at gqwithcam. If you'd like to help out in the funding for this podcast, visit our merch store where we've got hoodies, shirts, stickers, tumblers, mugs, and more at gqwithcam.com forward slash shop. And if you have a special guest idea, email me gqwithcam at gmail.com. Well, thanks again to our good friend Brandon Allen for coming up with our theme music. We're going to let him play us out and hope you guys have a great rest of your afternoon.